Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today I'm having on Linda from The Sewing Garden. We're going to talk about sourcing fabric, beginner sewing tips. She has a lot of great ones from her many years of experience. Projects. Uh, I have a few questions to ask her myself, just some projects that I want to do. So if you are interested in sewing or you know, you've know you been sewing a long time or even if you haven't sewn at all but you're interested, join us for this interview. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. All right. Well, thank you so much, Linda, for joining me. I know a lot of people in the, my listeners either are already sewers or sewists, however you want to put that, or they aspire to be, or maybe they're just curious. It sounds like something they want to try, but have a lot of fear because when you first get started, it can sound really confusing. I know that's kind of what kept me from doing it for so long is just feeling like I need to learn all the lingo, like it would be way too complicated. So we're going to dive into all that. Let's start by introducing you. Tell us a little bit about your background with sewing and what you offer people to help them learn. Well, thank you, Lisa, for having me on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. It's a joy to be here. Um, My name is Linda Prenslow, and I live in the base of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I started sewing when I was about seven years old. My dad bought me a sewing machine for my birthday, and then after I kind of got okay with it, I was a kid sewing machine. Let me back up and say that. Okay. Once I got... (laughs) better on that. Then they enrolled me in a singer sewing class where I learned to make a dress with darts and zippers and, you know, hem and all that. So then I just progressed through time and I majored in textiles and clothing, graduated at Colorado State University in 1983 and opened a sewing business, probably 1988, sewing bridesmaid dresses for people. And by, uh, after a couple of years, I realized that 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 was not as lucrative as I had hoped. It took a long time to make the muslin, the mock-up dress, and Mm, then the regular dress. And so then I went into alterations. And about 2006, a gentleman who had come over with his sport jacket for me to alter um, had lost a lot of weight. And I was explaining to him why I couldn't do all the alterations that he needed done. And he said, you should write a book. And I thought that that would really be difficult with all the pictures that I would need to show all the different steps of alteration. So I kind of shelved that dream for a few years and a friend of mine said, let's do a blogging course. And I just thought, what am I going to write about? And in the middle of the course, the instructor had to start a blog. And so through that, I just feel like it's been a way for me to share uh, the knowledge that God's given me through the years with other people around the world. And that's just been such a huge blessing to be able to help people without cost. You know, they could just jump on and learn how to sew and how to do some alterations. So yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. Sewing is such a great skill to have because like you said, alterations, so many of us, there'll be something say like a, a certain pair of jeans, maybe they're at a thrift shop. They're really nice, but they're too long being able to have those basic skills to be able to make those work for you or turn one thing into something else or take a dress that you found or like maybe some really beautiful fabric from it, turn that into something. It really opens up a lot of doors that one, it could be a lot cheaper if you know where to shop for things and how to actually go about that because it can also be more expensive. So we'll, we'll go into that. But then it can also just be really satisfying. I love being able to dream something up and then turn that vision into something, even if it's just a simple project. So I I know that's probably a lot of the reason behind why you love it. Obviously, you've been sewing for a long time, so you really love it. Where would you recommend someone get started? Like what project would you recommend first if somebody is learning how to sew via websites or YouTube? They know nothing. Yeah. And first of all, I wanted to say that I just really admire the way that you take on sewing, that I have not seen you use a paper pattern before from one of the big (laughs) companies that you just dive in and sometimes duplicate garment or or a project that you've already seen. 
And I think that's a real advanced technique. And yet I think what it takes is just that you understand the sewing process so that you can do that. Is that right? Is that how you, or did you try paper patterns and they didn't work for you? I think I'm really honestly just pretty intimidated by paper patterns, (laughs) which is crazy. But what happens with the paper patterns is I'm going off of just somebody else's uh, measurements. And there's probably a skill to that too, that we could talk about actually figuring out how to get the right pattern so that you don't waste all this time sewing and then you get to the end, you put it on and it's massive or it's too small. That's happened to me a lot to where I'm like, okay, it only, I only just want to copy like what already works because it's so difficult for me to go through this whole process. And then at the end, I see something huge, which once you understand sewing and understand how a garment's put together, you can try things on at various stages, not sew the entire thing and then find out that it doesn't fit. So there's definitely something to just using patterns to learn how something is put together and using that to your advantage. And I think that I'd like to buy a few patterns and do it a little bit more, even though copying clothes is my favorite way just to dive into it. Yeah. And I, that's a great point because I think that was one of my first struggles when I was 10, 12 years old, I was making clothes for myself that fit because I didn't know that I was supposed to look at the measurements on the pattern just, and then the measurements on me to put that two and two together. Apparently the instructor of my class did that for me and didn't teach me that. So then I started making clothes for my mom and her size off the rack was different than the pattern size. And so I kept making her these clothes that were too small and it was frustrating her and it was frustrating me. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is having to make alterations to the pattern before you sew sew the garment. And so to go back to your question of what are some simple projects? I think things that start with sewing a straight line, like bean bags or envelope pillow covers. I have a post on that on my blog on how to make those. Cloth napkins, I think that would be a really fun project to start with. Maybe those are too simple for what you're talking about, but I think if you're just starting out, I think anything like that, even curtains aren't too intimidating if you're making the gathered type, you know. Yeah. Your pinch pleated ones that you made recently are beautiful, by the way. And I think that your technique makes it much more simple than doing the old fashioned pleated drapes that we used to make years ago. (laughs) I don't even know Um, anything about the the right way to do it. So (laughs) who knows if my technique was right. (laughs) Oh, they used to use this stuff called pleater tape inside and it did give you the folds, but that gave you a much stiffer top to it. And that's not really the look anymore. So yeah. Well, and I have done pleater tape and I do them on curtains that are more formal or like stiffer fabric rather than linen, because you're right. It adds such a bulk to the back of the curtain. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that may not be the look people are going for these days. I I think they're looking for a softer drape or curtain. So, yeah. Um, Some other options might be gift bags, making or a wine bottle gift bag. That's really simple, too. Or those rice bags where you fill a bag with rice and you throw it in the microwave to heat it up. If you have a microwave, that is. And the baby swaddle blankets, those are simple. So there's lots Mm -hmm. of different little projects like that that don't take much time and give you some confidence in your sewing. Yeah, some more that I was thinking about are like aprons and linen totes, because those are basically just squares with straps attached to it. So you're having like Mm -hmm. a long rectangle attached to a square that'd make a nice apron or with the linen totes, just sewing two squares right sides together and then adding, well, adding the straps to the top. Pretty simple. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That would give you a lot of confidence and just a joy in making something quickly, you know? Yeah. Okay, so I have an upcoming project that I've never done, which I've done, I've done things that are intimidating, like I've done chair covers, and we could talk about that, which, whew, those are, I think those are hard no matter which way you do it, are not exactly hard, but just very, very time consuming. But something that I've never made is I want to make like big, formal, lined drapes. And the thing that I'm running into more than even just that the project's intimidating because I, I know I can do it because I want to do the pleater tape at the top. I want to use the right fabric to line it so that way they're also black out because I want to put it in my boys' room so that whenever, like right now, now that the time has changed, it's dark or it's staying light closer and closer to bedtime and soon it'll be after bedtime. I like to have something to make it to where it, it feels a little bit darker in the room. And I, all these years, I've never done that. Like it's nine o'clock in July and I really want the kids to think that it's bedtime. So anyways, my, my issue is figuring out what fabric is the best to line them with. And then also fabric is so expensive. I'm looking into this project 
And this is why I've always just bought curtains off of like Amazon or Target or whatever, because you're looking at spending hundreds of dollars per panel. Is there a trick or is this just what formal drapes cost? I'm kind of thinking maybe it sort of is. Yeah, they are expensive. That And the material to make them is too. So there is a room darkening fabric lining that you can buy at a big box store like Joann's that goes on the back. And I do have a okay. post on that on oh. on drapes that I've bought already. And I've, I've yeah. put that on the back as a lining so that for that same reason that the room is dark for my grandkids so they don't wake up at Oh, dark 30, you know? Yes, yes. So I think that is one way of doing it is just buy those pre-made drapes and put that room darkening lining on the back. Or else maybe you could find old bed sheets or something that's a large piece of fabric that would cover that window that's not as expensive, maybe at a thrift store or something. I'm not really sure what you have in your area, but that might be another option. Yeah. Or just waiting till you see your favorite fabric on clearance or something. Yeah. I was looking at this one website that I found on another blog that she referred and they were the most beautiful drapes I've ever seen. And I put in like my measurements and the lining I wanted and it was going to be like $900 per panel. I'm like, Hmm, let's see. That, that That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> Cause I have long, tall ceilings too. And so it makes it to where, yeah, yes. the, the, the curtains, I always, I think the issue is not so much like sometimes I'm fine with investing like in a wool rug or something that I know my house is going to be wearing forever. But with, with that, you also have to be sure that you've chosen the right thing because there's no way you're going to, in five years, swap out the curtains if you're spending, you know, a ton of money on them. Even when they're handmade, they are going to be really pricey just to get the fabric that you want, to get that really formal look that I'm kind of going for here. Yes, because, you know, as you know, you can use a drop cloth or muslin or something cheap like that, but it's not going to have that nice hand no. and that nice drape that you're looking for. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah, I think your best bet for the cheapest end of that kind of fabric is probably going to be a Joann's or a Hancock Fabrics or whatever you have close to you. Hobby Lobby mm -hmm. might have something. I don't know. But yeah, that's the discouraging part. But maybe there's a way to look for those pre-made drapes and then alter them um, from yes. like garage sales or even, you know, thrift stores that are already pre-made. Yeah, I was thinking that like finding or even just like the cheaper end curtains at Target or Pottery, Pottery Barn, it's not cheap, but they are cheaper than a lot of the stuff I was looking into. And taking just a regular flat panel or even a panel that has some tabs or something, and then taking that off, adding the, the liner, and then adding the pleater tape, and then just like transforming those, which I'm not sure how that makes it all turn out. But anyways, I think that's a problem that a lot of people have because whenever I see these really gorgeous rooms online, they're anchored by these very beautiful curtains. And I think indecisiveness has been what's always kept me from wanting to spend any money on curtains, you know, because they just to do that was, is so expensive. Yeah. $900 is a lot. Are yeah, yours that, taller than 95 inches? Um, yeah. See, I need, what do I need up there? The upstairs rooms are shorter. That's another problem with going to like Target or something is they never even have in stock the curtains that I would need. Cause I need, I think I need, I think I need the 108 inches up there, wow. but then I have to alter them a little bit too. Yeah. And even a tablecloth, you could buy a 120 inch tablecloth, but I don't that's know true. if that's going to be the fabric that you're looking for. So you might hunt around in that department. Yeah, I didn't really look if, around at that. Yeah. Cause those can be. And even longer, I think I've seen some of their in the 144 inch area as well. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And then another issue whenever you're buying curtains to alter and then put the pleater tape on is they're not wide enough before. Have you ran into that if you try doing that? Like you need way more width if you're going to add the pleats beforehand than a tab curtain would need. Yeah. So a lot of times in the past when I've made those is I've seamed two together or I've seamed one and a half and oh. I've, I've made the pleater tape in such a way that the seam is hidden in the back of one of the pleats so that when it's hanging, hanging okay. up, you don't see that seam. If that makes sense, the oh. fold is toward the window okay. or that seam, I should say it's towards the window in that fold right. of that pleat. And it just goes down the middle, like top to bottom. That looks best, I think, is having it in the middle of that okay. panel. Yeah, I know it's hard, especially yeah. if you've got big windows like you do with the bright sun coming through. You don't want everyone to see that. But I also think that when you put that room darkening fabric uh, behind it, it'll help 
soften that yeah. seam look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a post on your uh, website, sewingdarden.com with some of your curtain alterations that you've done. Yes. And they're, si they're more simple than you think, especially if you're buying pre-made drapes to just put that yeah. blackening fabric on the back. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about a sponsor, Tubes & Co. Organic Skincare. I have loved Tubes & Co. for I don't even know how long now. <laughs> they use high quality ingredients like grass-fed tallow. All winter long, I have been putting that stuff on my face three or four times a day. I just leave the little jar sitting out so that I can go back over and put it on my face again because I really struggle with dry skin in the winter. And natural moisturizers a lot of times don't have ingredients that absorb into the skin. Usually they're very oily, they sit on top of the skin. I've really struggled with that. Tallow does. And they focus on those types of high quality ingredients throughout all of their products. So I'm also a huge fan of the makeup. Currently, I have on the Tubes & Co. foundation, their little eyebrow thing I just started getting into. <laughs> it is the best. It has a brush on one side and then a little pencil on the other. Their mascara. I haven't tried anything that I didn't like. I've been referring family and friends. And then of course, my listeners, it just so happens they sponsor this show, but I am all in sold on Tubes & Co. products for sure. I will be a lifelong customer. I've always wanted a high quality makeup and skincare source, everything from the face wash to the moisturizers to the makeup. And it's just really hard to find. Tubes & Co. is a family company. They're made right here in the USA. All the things I love supporting. They are offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off your order with the code FARMHOUSE. So you can go over to tubesandco.com and use the code FARMHOUSE to try out some beautiful skincare products that I know you're going to love. Okay, so what are some of your tips for starting a child out sewing if you have never sewn before? So I think this is, I got this as a listener question. I think they're wanting, and I, I get this a lot, they're wanting their child to learn to sew, but they don't actually have, you know, any knowledge yet to teach them. What are some suggestions that you have? Well, my favorite book when I was teaching my kids how to sew was the Sewing Machine Fun book. And it's, you know, it's probably six bucks now on thrift books or whatever. But what I love about this book is that it teaches, and there's a lot of good ones out there, I'm sure. The reason I love it so much is they talk about taking the thread out of your needle. And they use these diagrams where you're just stitching back and forth straight lines. You can even do it on computer paper if you want. Just draw some shapes on a computer paper and have the child stitch back and forth. Once they get proficient at the straight lines, then maybe draw some wavy lines or triangles or circles or whatever. And I would start with that. And at the same time, maybe they could memorize the parts of the machine because I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And once they progress from that, then this, pro this book has a lot of projects that are simple for kids, even adults, but they're things that are fun for the kids to do. And now this one's really old. This is my daughter's project from 1996, if you can imagine. But this was one of the first projects they had her do was just take a photograph and then you have this clear vinyl fabric and she stitched it around and put all this confetti inside. Super simple, but a way to learn how to put two fabrics together, for instance, and something that she can keep as a keepsake. But it progresses. It teaches them how to sew buttons on by hand and it teaches them zippers and just all kinds of things at a very basic level. Yeah. So if you don't get that book, there's many out there, like I said, that work really well. So I would start with that. Yeah. I, I have with my kids, well, I have two that are interested in sewing. Um, my One of my daughters is, one of my daughters isn't. And both of them, what I did was get, I got them a sewing machine and I taught them how to thread it because that's the first place people get intimidated is well, I don't even know how to thread the machine. And here's the thing with sewing machines is they're all pretty much the same. So I think people think, okay, well, I don't know how to work this one. 
But I had a sewing machine when I was a kid or my mom always had one set up in her room and that I could just go in there and work on. And the, that sewing machine and then the sewing machines that I buy today, it's the exact same little process. And it's so simple. I'm not kidding. It's so easy. So that's definitely not something to get intimidated by. And um, if I think people run into really common problems like the the bobbin and the tension on the bottom gets all uh, jumbled up, you you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is just solved by, honestly, almost 99% of the time, just re-threading it. So learning how to thread a machine, which you could find a very basic tutorial on YouTube, knowing that it's almost like your phone restarting something, so re-threading it if something's not working almost always works. And then just let them, I personally took the kids that were interested and let them just play around. I got them fabric, I got them thread, the little supplies they needed, and they would make things that were totally just not even a real thing. Like my daughter would make pants that she'd sew stuff to and it didn't look right. But now that she's 14, she's making real stuff. And then I have a son who's kind of in that same process right now where he makes stuff and it's like, oh, cool. But then later on, I'm sure it'll actually turn into something real. So that's been something that I have to supply what they need for it, get it ready for them, show them how to do it. Both those kids can now thread their machines by themselves. And then just letting them experiment really does a lot. Absolutely. And my, it was my dad that taught me how to sew when I was a kid. And so I think it's great to get the boys involved as well. And I might give another tip for those threads that jam down in the bobbin. Um, a lot of times that also happens because what what's helpful is to hold both those threads, the bobbin thread and the needle thread, behind the machine as you take the first couple stitches and then let okay. go. Because oh, okay, sometimes okay. that thread just gets jammed right down inside there and then you've you've been there before where you can't even hardly get the thread out or the you know the you can't get the flywheel to turn because it's so jammed right i don't know if you've yes. ever had that experience oh, yes yeah but a lot of people tell me that they stop sewing because they can't seem to unjam the sewing machine so mm -hmm. try both those things try the rethreading and also try the holding those threads and kind of get in that habit of doing both and i think they'll have a lot more success that way but yes, I think it's really great that they can play around on the machine and get used to it and do their own thing. It's that That's the creative side of sewing that I think is so important. Yeah. And what it comes down to is I think a lot of moms, I don't have that much time to sit down and show somebody how to sew. Now, it, it ends up being a lot of learning on the fly. So they'll try something and then eventually my daughter wanted to know, well, how do you actually do ruffles? Because I've been just kind of like gathering like, oh, okay, sorry, you need to put this, you know, you need to put on a really loose stitch, do your tension really high, put the fabric through. She's like, oh, so there's times whenever they need me to show them how to do something. But a lot of it is just letting them figure it out on their own. And that's given them a lot of practice. They've learned, okay, when, like you mentioned, the, the machine gets jammed. That's actually really simple once you understand a sewing machine. You you can kind of open that little side door thingy and, and then open the little bobbin area and see if you see anything jammed in there, pull that out and then rethread it. That does fix an awful lot of problems. So I think learning how to just know your way a little bit around the machine, just understanding basics of how it works is going to get you a long way because you can, after that, a lot of it really is pretty simple. Absolutely. And then YouTube channels. There are several good YouTube channels that have little basic projects, but at first they're not really going to be able to do anything. They're just going to want to like sew two pieces of fabric together and say, oh, look at my bag. And it's, it wasn't right sides yes. together. And the straps are, you can see all the seams. And that's when I give them some tips like, oh, just so you know, if you sew around the outside and then flip it out, you won't see that. And then they kind of put all that together. Absolutely. Yeah. And they can make little blankets for their dolls or whatever they play with. You know, it's, there's yes. just all kinds of things that, mm -hmm. that are fun to make. Yeah. It's a great hobby. Yes. Yes. It is. And it keeps them busy. I like having so many things around my house and it depends on the kids. Some of them don't care about sewing at all, but for some of them, that's something that if I just get them the tools, you don't have to worry. You know, we do a lot of in our culture, which is, is completely understandable, but a lot of worrying about screen time and keeping kids off screens, keeping kids doing things, just get them a lot of tools and set them up and they won't, they won't have to because there's going to be something that they can creatively play with. It's, it's when you won't let them 
make messes, try things out, that that ends up being an issue, I feel like. Yeah, it's less messy than Play-Doh, too. It, oh, yes, it is. I let the kids play Play-Doh, too, and that's it's way less messy. Just some threads and fabric <laughs> scraps. Okay, so with that, what about the best machine for basic, simple sewing projects? So I know this will, I feel like, I don't know, you can almost say anything right now, but maybe you have an opinion. You know, I think you could speak to it better because I've seen the machines that you've bought and that you've bought Ruthie and I didn't know you had bought Johanna one too, but I feel like um, I've been using the same machine for 40 years, so I love it. I haven't had any trouble with it, so I, I can't really, you can buy it on eBay and it's not too expensive, but it's still more okay. than probably an entry level machine would cost. But I think what I would say first is why don't you borrow a machine first from somebody that you know, because chances are there's a lot of people that have sewing machines in their closet that they haven't used for years. They might say that mm -hmm. they're broken. Well, it would be cheaper to go have them or you get it fixed or, or tuned up or greased up or whatever it needs. And just try a few different brands to see what features you like, see what brands you like. And maybe that person would sell it to you or give it to you because they're not using it anymore. So that might be one way just to kind of get used to the, sewing machine process itself so that so that you would know for sure that you like sewing. But I would love to hear you speak about yours and how you came to the decision on yours. Okay. So I don't have a super strong opinion on this. I know people do, but I always just say I get the basic brother machine. And the reason for that is that they just sell it at Walmart. That's why. Because there's been times when something like what I have my sewing business, a sewing machine would break and I needed to get one right now. I didn't have time to order one. I didn't have time to go down to a dealership. I could just go over to Walmart and get one. And they have this brother machine. Sometimes it has little designs on it and that always changes. I don't know why, but it's just a very basic brother machine. It's a hundred dollars. So it's, it's not a massive investment. And then I also have a brother machine. And the reason I have that one is because my sister has a sewing business and she's always just gone to this certain dealership that sells brother. And so I've always just gone to him too. And he sold me on this really, not really expensive, but like a $400 machine that has the automatic needle threader thing. And then it's like all computerized. So instead of pressing the pedal, you just press the button. Honestly, I don't like it any better than the one that I got my kids, the basic machine. So really my suggestion is Whatever one you can get. If you see one at a thrift shop or somebody has one they can give you or you find one on Marketplace, they really do all operate basically the same. I'm sure that there's people who have a certain brand and they're like, oh, no, no, they don't. There's there's this one. It's way better. I'm <laughs> sure you're right. But I have I don't do anything super fancy either. Like I don't need the little special like closure stitches or the embroidery stitches that my more expensive brother has. I just need a straight stitch, I need to be able to adjust the tension, adjust the stitch length, do a back stitch, a zigzag, and that's pretty much all I need. Is there any other stitches that you feel like are super necessary? No, I have a, like I say, I have this 40 year old machine. It's a, it's a Bernina. It's a, it's before they made the computerized version Yeah, and it's got like probably 26 embroidery stitches. And I bet I've only used those twice. Yeah. I just, just for don't fun, like to find see. the need for them. Right. Yeah. Just to see what it looks like. But they, I haven't really liked how they look on a garment. So I just haven't used them. So uh -huh. I agree with you, the basic stitches and I don't think you have to invest a lot. It's going to be probably cheaper than your kid's sports fee this year, you know, to invest in a sewing machine. So to uh -huh. me, I think it's worth it. And then as they progress and they, you know, they really are into it, maybe they do, maybe you do spend money down the road on a more expensive one. But I really think the entry level machines are going to do just fine for them, especially since you've had that experience. Yeah, those have always been great. And then we went to a dealership recently or how recent was that maybe a year or two ago already here in a, a different town and he sold what brand was it but it crashed out quick and like I had already spent money on fixing it I'm like I could just go buy another one of those little brothers for 100 bucks rather than get this fixed because I think the fixing fee was 150 dollars so anyways I'm back to it again and we ours get so much use and maybe that speaks to that they're not that great because I do feel like I've bought I don't know. I've only probably bought like five new sewing machines in the last 10 years and they haven't all been for me. Like I've bought, we, we have three that are always working is what I'm trying to say. So we're not constantly replacing them, but it is something that yours 
has held out for 20 plus years and you've done all this sewing on it. We're also probably pretty hard on them too. My kids probably put through stuff they shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've only had to replace the, the light once and then the foot pedal. That's it. Okay. The, the machine itself has been a workhorse. And yeah. now do yours sew on denim or heavy items? Well, I don't know that we've tried it a lot. The kids have, I think I always thought that depended more on the needle, not as much the machine, but maybe I'm maybe not. Well, I want to give a quick tip real quick. So when you're sewing on denim, yes, you want a denim needle for sure. But then there's that bump on those denim, on those jeans, you know, where you, you know what I'm talking about, like the double, the flat felled seam, it's got a double stitching on it mm -hmm. and that's really thick. Yeah. So just roll up some fabric like this and stick it behind the presser foot so that when you're going over that bump, it goes right onto, I, well, what am I trying to say? You've got this back there. It's just so that your presser foot doesn't go up or down the this part. Right. That makes um, sense. Because if it goes up mm -hmm. and over, it can jam your needle. So just use this in front and behind oh. just some fabric. They make stuff you can buy, right. but you might as well just use, use it on a wad there. of fabric. Yeah. And that helps right. go over that bump really easily. And if you feel like it's can't, it's just not going to make it because I have tried to do some pretty heavy duty stuff in mine. I'll just walk it mm -hmm. through yes. that bump with my flywheel and then right. keep going. So mm -hmm. that's another another idea. Yeah, or just go really, really super slow, just like barely yes. press your foot down. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Somebody also asks your suggestions for making prep enjoyable. They say they really love to sew but hate cutting out the pattern pieces. I was trying to think what I didn't like about cutting. And I think on certain patterns, you'll see a, you'll see these notches, right? You'll see these kind of notches on your pattern piece. And mm -hmm. yes, in some patterns, they stick out like this and you're not really supposed to cut those off. But if, if there's the notch to the end, so I draw it inward if, if there's not one there, but I just go ahead and cut those off because those were so annoying to me to go, you know, up and over and around. Uh -huh. And so what I do instead now is I just take my scissors and I clip, if it's a single notch like that, I just clip in quarter inch with my scissors. Mm -hmm. And on this one, it's a double notch. I just clip in one clip and then two clips. So you'll know with a double notch, this is always the back of the sleeve and this is always the front of the sleeve. Okay. So that kind of speeds that up. I don't know why that was annoying to me, but I just never liked that. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was thinking of, because I don't really know who whoever asked this question, what they were meaning by that. But one of the things is, is when you've got three yards or more of fabric and you've got pattern pieces all pinned down, you don't really have a great spot for that. So you, sometimes you put it on the floor to cut it, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things might be is that you don't, you know, you spend a lot of time on the floor and that it, right. it gets, your back gets sore, your knees, whatever. So I cut around a little bit bigger around that piece, like maybe a, maybe a shape like that. I'll cut around right, that. Just a quick... And then I'll take this piece, yeah, take that piece to the kitchen table right. and then cut them out individually. Mm -hmm. That seems to help too. Yeah, that's a um, good tip. I guess if all else fails, just hire a kid to do it and give them a nice reward. Yeah, as long as it's not too expensive you know, have of fabric. Them cut yeah. it out for you. That's <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah. Make sure they yeah. know. I do have doing. one that I would definitely, definitely trust to do it. And then I have the rest I wouldn't trust. But the oldest I would definitely trust. She's detail oriented enough that she wouldn't she wouldn't mess that up. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you mind cutting things out? Is that a issue for you? Um, not really. Um, it doesn't bother me so much. I will say if you're using a pattern, having your size or something that you use often, saving it from an original project, like you said earlier, altering the pattern and then having a master copy, never neglecting to save the exact piece that works for you and having that process already done. Because, you know, when you first buy a pattern, it comes on paper. You have to cut it out to your right size. Once you've gone through all of that, it's pretty simple to copy it. And then have you ever taken the pattern piece and transferred it to something more permanent that you could save rather than paper? Absolutely. If I can tell it's a pattern that I'm going to love and use over and over again, I'll trace it. There is pattern tracing paper available at the stores, but honestly, I just use newsprint or something I have, not a newspaper. Something but the, thicker. Yeah. And I'll save it that way and just fold it up and put it back in the envelope or a bigger Ziploc bag because it's annoying to try to get that pattern back in that envelope sometimes. Yes. But yeah, I do like to save that. I do uh, I do 
notice also when you're duplicating a garment and you're making another, I notice that you add seam allowances and that's so important. You've got to add those seam allowances, obviously, or, or if you start stitching, it's going to end up to be a smaller right. garment than what you started mm -hmm. with. I, when I first started sewing, I would sew, I, I started sewing when I was a kid, but I didn't sew anything real, you know, something that you could actually wear or anything until I really learned to sew when my daughter was a baby. And everything I made, I made too small for the longest time. I'm like, I, I always thought I added enough. I never added enough. It was just like my pattern was just always a little bit too small. So that's a good tip. Last year, I had the awesome opportunity to welcome homesteading family to our farm to shoot a beautiful video on fermenting vegetables as part of their School of Traditional Skills, which is a collection of classes that teaches everything from gardening to herbs, sourdough, chickens and eggs, everything in between in a very beautiful way. So they brought in their professional crew and shot almost like a show that you would have seen on like Food Network or something with the most beautiful classes. And as a member of the School of Traditional Skills, you get access to all of their new classes. So they have been adding new classes all the time. They have traditional sourdough breads, nourishing bone broths with Sally Fallon Morell, raised bed gardening, keeping milk goats, gardening season extension, back to Eden gardening, curing pork, pressure canning, pasture, so many things. So if you are wanting to expand your skills, whether you are on a city lot and you wanna get better with the traditional cooking in your kitchen, or you've moved to a, a little plot of land where you're gonna put in a garden, the School of Traditional Skills, I highly recommend. You can find that at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse skills and become a member and get access to all of their classes as they launch them. So much good information over there to help you learn how to learn some of these skills that we've known for generations and have basically forgotten. But now there is such a beautiful way to learn them again. Again, head over to bit.ly forward slash farmhouse skills for the School of Traditional Skills. Okay, so another question, which we talked a little bit about this, we touched on it, but finding fabric, because this is the, the thing that will make sewing a magic wand for wardrobes that you can go to the thrift shop, turn anything into something else, and then you have this really awesome dress that fits just you or your child or whatever. I used to turn men's button down shirts into dresses for my daughters that were so cute. Or it can be something that's actually really pricey. And you'll understand. I have a friend who she likes to buy stuff uh, on Etsy for her daughters. And she always is like, I just, I can't imagine what this person might make, you know, with uh, how expensive this dress is. And I tell her it's actually not expensive at all. Like whenever you account for that person's hourly wage of making that dress, the fabric costs, if it's a really cute dress, and it's high quality. The fabric was not cheap. Like you said, you used to make dresses from scratch and you found out that that wasn't profitable at all. I'm imagining it's because of all of this. We're so used to being able to go on Amazon, go on Walmart, Target, buy a dress for $25 that we're totally skewed in our brains about what stuff that's quality that is made by like not a factory actually costs that, I mean, how could we not be when you can get something for 25 bucks? I understand. But what are some of your tips or what have been some of your favorite sources for fabric? Say you're sewing something for your grandkids or something not for your business, but you're just trying to make something for personal use. If I want to make something with cotton fabric, say like for a granddaughter or something, I'll go to a quilt shop because I love their cotton fabrics. They're just high quality. They're amazing. If you can find them there, I love seeing and seeing the fabric in person. I'm not big on, I think you and Callie Martin talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Joanne's has a lot of fabric and they're a great source as well. But sometimes you go in there, you just can't find what you're looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. So I never can. So yeah. I, yeah, it's just really hard. I think Hobby Lobby, sometimes the same. So you have to go online and, and just take a chance sometimes. And, and that's one way of finding fabric. Another is ask people, you know, who are 
avid quilters or seamstresses because they have a stash. Trust me, they have cupboards full, closets full of fabric. And sometimes they're willing to part with a lot of it because, you know, they just cum- accumulated over time and they may have what exactly what you're looking for. So just ask around. That's another thing. Thrift stores, like you said, take apart clothing and put it back together, make something smaller, like you said uh, you did with your husband's shirts or men's shirts. So I think those are some options. Um, I remember that you used to have, was it an Etsy store way back when you actually lived on Boone mm-hmm. Street? You were selling like pillow covers, right? Yeah. How mm-hmm. did you source those? That was, were those linen? Um, pieces, they like, were from- a like grain sack, thick, what would you call that? I don't even know what the exact material was. Almost like not burlap, but they were very heavyweight. I was I got a wholesale account on Primitives by Kathy for that where just it was I didn't figure that out for a while and I bought stuff on Etsy and it was just ridiculous when I found out how much cheaper it was. So if you're so- sewing anything in bulk, definitely look into wholesale. You can get wholesale probably any fabric designer if you dig deep enough or any fabric that you really love. A wholesale account, it's it's going to be like half the price. But you have to buy bolts a lot of times. And you have to buy a whole bolt. Yeah. So that's the thing. That's why now I don't really do that. I don't do it at all, actually, anymore. But if you're going to be sewing... Honestly, though, I wonder if that would be worth looking into for a curtain fabric if I really liked it. Like, how much do I have to buy of this? (laughs) Because I'll need a lot of yards. Yeah, especially if you have to do more than one window, for sure. Mm -hmm. I do, But I don't really have a good answer for the fabric because I tried all kinds of different ways and places to source my fabric. And I end up just going for the cute factor, whatever I think is going to be cute. If I have to bite the bullet and pay more than I normally would, I just do it if I really am excited about the project. If I'm not, then I'll just get a basic yeah. fabric that I don't really care too much about and mm-hmm. and whip that up. Yes. Well, I'm the same. I A lot of times when I'm sewing it's not because I want to do the thing cheaper. It's usually motivated more by wanting something really custom that I can't find. Now, that hasn't always been the case. I think when I first started sewing, just things were tighter and it was more about finding... Well, a lot of times it was about both. I wanted to have these really cute little boutique dresses for my daughter and I also didn't want to... I didn't want to buy them or I couldn't buy them. And so I kind of married those two desires. And then I also would do it for things like making over furniture that was really cheap. So that way I could have a pretty couch without spending whatever thousands of dollars on a new couch. I would say now my motivation to sew just because I have less time is more if I can't find it somewhere else because it's something very specific, which happens a lot because I have very specific desires in my home decor. That's usually what motivate me to sew. And so I will usually go for the the fabric I want more than um, worrying about the cost. But there there's definitely ways, sheets, large, extra large dresses or something that has a lot of bulk to it, especially if you're sewing for a little kid, you can almost use anything to do to sew that with. And then mixing and matching has always been, I don't have time anymore. And I have, my daughters are 14 and 12. We have five boys. I'm pregnant with a boy. So it's it's not near as fun. But when I had little girls... I would go in and I would find a large men's shirt that had stripes. And then I would find maybe a floral, like say the shirt was navy blue and white stripes. And then I'd find a extra large women's floral dress that had like a blue in it. And that would coordinate. Then maybe I'd find a polka dot and I would sit the three together and mix and match these really fun fabrics where one part would be a ruffle. One would be a little detail for the bodice. One would be the skirt. One would be you know, for the both sleeves and I would mix and match it and make like these very boutique looking dresses. And for little girls, especially when you're mixing and matching several different pieces together, it's really easy to find enough. Whereas with like curtains, you need six panels in a room. They all have to match. You're not going to find six matching sheets at a thrift shop. So that's usually the issue. Yeah. And so you, well, you could find the six matching sheets at Target or whatever, but it just depends on if you like that fabric or not. And I remember those dresses. Those were adorable. I don't know if they're still on your blog, but those were so cute. They're still on there. You just have that. (laughs) (laughs) Don't have time anymore. I know. By the way, congratulations on baby number eight. Thank you. Yeah. And just having, uh, 
the girls, you know, being 14 and 12, you don't sew little cutesy things anymore. And there are cute things to sew for boys, but it's hard because whenever their pants or like a little linen jumpsuit, they ruin that. They crawl around in it and they ruin it. Whereas like these playful dresses with all these colors, my daughters could wear them like hundreds of times. I pass them down from one daughter to the next and then my niece and they, you know, you put little tights on them and that's what the got the the knee holes. But the dresses themselves and with all the different colors, they lasted forever. I bought quality cottons and linens and they, they lasted. Whereas the boys, the things I've sewn for them so far, just they just don't they're just not as play ready as the dresses always were. And so I haven't found things I love to sew, which has been really sad, but I probably don't have time for it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think a few of the items I can think of for boys might be those little mats that you can put on the floor with uh, yeah. roadways. You can make up oh, some yeah. roadways and some buildings and that kind of thing. Quilts are always a good one. There's a True, little, quilts. I've made little stuffy sleeping bags for their, they call them stuffies now. When I was a kid, they were stuffed animals, but you know, little sleeping oh, bags okay. for them. Different things like mm-hmm. that yes. uh, that they enjoy. Yeah, that's true. A little toys. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> things, but you kind of have to dig a little deeper and look a little more to find them. Yeah, and I just really loved the putting together fun fabrics and coordinating. And it's eh, – I don't think my husband would be too happy with me if I made like – I tried that when my son was little. I tried making him like matching ties. But now it would be two cute dresses with six matching ties. Like, okay – that's just doesn't have the same mix and match feel to it, you know? <laughs> so uh, uh, maybe I'll have granddaughters. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of work. One day. Yes, maybe so. <laughs> I'll definitely yeah. sell for them. Okay, let me see if there's any more questions on here that the audience asks that would be good to talk about. Okay, so some that are in regards to specific projects. I don't really know what your experience is on this, but like, have you done or how to make chair covers? Yeah. So one of the things I love to use when I'm taking apart a chair or a couch to reupholster or whatever is a tool that's made for this. Let me see if I can. There we go. This is called an Osborne staple puller. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Yes. Um, But there are other tools online that do the job well, I'm sure. I used to try to use a flathead screwdriver and I just could not get those deeply embedded staples up. So okay. most of the time the chair covers, and I'm guessing, do you think they're talking about like dining room chair covers? I, um, I, don't, know. I don't know if they are meaning, well, maybe, I guess reupholstery. Yeah. And then probably also some slip covers. People get really excited about that because it's, that's something that really saves you money because you're taking you know, couches are very expensive. So you're taking maybe a couch you think is just uh, so ugly and making it fit in with your decor. But that that works with any kind of chair, whether it's a slip cover or you're reupholstering it. Yeah, any any tips you have is fine. Yeah, so when I was about 14, I went to the neighbor's house. She was going to reupholster her couch. So I said, oh, can I come over when you start doing that? I got to see that. And yeah. she said, basically, all you need to do is take it apart, pay attention to how it's put together as you're taking it apart, And then rip apart each piece and use those as patterns and then put it all back together again, right? Like stitching. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing a slip cover, you want to, I think I've seen you do this where you take the fabric, bigger piece than the piece that you're going to cover, and you pinch it to the, you know, you pinch it around the couch or the chair or whatever and pin it. Yes. And that becomes your seam where those pins are. You just snug it up. Yes. I think you have a tutorial Mm -hmm. on that. And so- I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that it's not hard. It looks really intimidating and it takes time, but it's not as difficult as it seems to be because you can be really forgiving with slip covers, not so much with upholstery as it an upholstered couch or whatever. Right. It needs to look, you know, it needs to look like kind of what it did before you took it apart. But the slip covers are real forgiving. And I love those because you can pull them off and wash them and put them back on. And anyway, uh-huh. um, So you could probably speak to that just as well as I can, but I I feel like slip covers, uh, you want a durable fabric if you can find one. Don't want to use something thin because it might be uh, the next year you might be making another one. Well, yeah, you don't do that. Especially with a lot of kids. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, don't do that. Did you use drop cloths for yours or what did you use when you made your slip covers? I used drop cloth and I, I used to have two sofas 
And I, I ended up getting rid of those eventually because I got I kind of mixed and matched my furniture. But I still have the two wingback chairs that I did years ago. And I actually need to wash them. They are they every about six months I have to wash them, even though you should probably do it more. That's about all I do. And they still look perfect. I almost every time I wash them, I still have to like there's always a few spots that have holes that I have to sew up because I didn't Looking back, I definitely was just like trying to get the project done. And so there are spots that I'm like, okay, I wish I would have like done a better job of reinforcing the stitch and like knowing that I was going to have these washed so many times over the course of a decade, but they're still totally fine. I usually just put them into the washer with some hot water and some bleach, hang them out to dry and then sew up any spots that came apart and they always look brand new again. So yeah, I use drop cloth. Drop cloth is sort of a like like the curtains behind me um, color. So I bleached it, which this I don't know if I would do that now. I'd probably would just leave it that color. But I made them at the time when, you know, all white everything was just like sweeping the nation and having that very minimal interior. I really enjoyed it. and I still like it. But of course, I'm I'm in my Victorian house. I'm adding lots of color, lots of pattern. But if you still do desire that bright white look, which also what's good about that is you can bleach it. Mm -hmm. And so whenever they get almost beyond repair, I put them in with bleach and they come out perfect again. So there, there is that advantage with it. So I have a tutorial on my blog for how to bleach drop cloth. It's quite a process because it has to soak a really long time to go from that, you know, linen-y color to bleach. But I'm amazed at how well they've held up. Like they're still the chairs we use in our living room today. And we have seven kids and we've had them for I want to say close to seven years. I definitely made them in the old house. So they're still holding up. I think you can use that writ dye too. Did you do that for your drapes in your mudroom? I did. And that would be a good idea if you want to. I don't know if you would. Have you tried dyeing? No, I think I did. I didn't bleach those first, did I? I think I went straight from the, the drop cloth color to the dyed color, which that would make the process really straightforward. You wouldn't have to use bleach, which would be great. And then they would be probably a little bit more washable if you go for a dark color. So yeah, that would be another option. So how are they holding up with the sun and wear and tear? Do they do they fade over time? Do you have to re-dye them? How's that? Well, working? we actually haven't had those curtains. We never did have those curtains up very long. We ended up taking out that like second set of windows and making that more of like a breezy room. And also it just, it ended up being very impractical to have curtains in the mudroom, especially once it hung to the floor, because that room just, it's beyond hope. Like it's, it gets used to the fullest extent as a mudroom. And so I'm sure that they would fade. Yeah, I haven't, I didn't really give it the full go to know they weren't in there long enough. Well, and it's a mudroom, so you probably don't care as much as your living room or bedroom probably. No. Yeah. So washing them was very impractical. I'm like, I just, this is, why would I have curtains in here? After a while, I, I thought, I mean, maybe eventually we would again, but right now that room is way too high traffic. It gets who knows what in it. It's just a mess all the time. Yeah. Well, I, I did want to finish um, talking about if they're doing a chair cover, uh, like a dining room chair. So there are like these hand staple guns that you can buy. You don't have to have an air mm -hmm. compressor and, an, you know, a uh, heavy duty stapler or whatever, but you can okay. use those generally, unless you're going into wood, then you will need a, I think you'll need an air compressor and a, one of those air guns to okay. do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, those are really simple to do. If you're working in the dining room, I did recently post how to cover a bench seat. Like at the, my daughter had a bench that went at the foot of her bed. And so okay. we just recovered that and put that new fabric on and stapled it. it was super fast project probably done within an hour and a half two hours and that did not need any advanced sewing skills either so you know just because you look at a piece of furniture don't get intimidated that that's not that that's going to be too hard for you because mm -hmm. a lot of times it's really not well I always say if you can sew a straight seam you can do pretty much anything yes there's, there's not a whole lot you can't do it's just a matter mm -hmm. of kind of thinking it through and planning for it, giving it yeah. enough time. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, your friend said with the uh, chair covers, you do, you take it apart, make sure you really pay attention with each and every part you're taking apart so you can study exactly what goes back where, maybe make some notes, maybe write on it. You know, this is chair front, right, or whatever. 
this meets to chair front left and then like label things. And then you do, you just take it apart, use the pattern pieces and put it back together again. And I know that sounds maybe like overly simplified, but it's true. And that's how it works too with garments. Say your child has a favorite pair of pants. Maybe they're something that you got handmade on Etsy and they got a hole in them and you want to recreate them. Well, one, you could put like a patch on them and, you know, make a cute little patch. But if you, if they're ruined, taking them apart, using a little seam ripper, you know, making sure you don't just cut them apart so that you can actually note the seam allowance and then just labeling each part of that pattern piece and then, you know, putting it down on fabric. If the child's grown a little bit, maybe adding, you know, a little, little bit here and there all around it so that way that it can be a little bigger, but studying how things are put together will get you a really, really long way with sewing. Yeah. It's just a matter of thinking it through. And like you say, studying, mm -hmm. and then if they're growing, they've grown two inches this year, you add three inches to the pattern piece or the pants, you know, whatever. Yes. Yeah. So good points. Yes. Okay. What tips and tricks do you have just in general for the listeners who want to sew, or maybe they already sew, but you have a lot of experience to offer behind your answer here. So I was trying to think of some things that have really expedited my sewing because when I want, when I sit down to sew, I want the fastest way possible mm -hmm. through the situation. Yeah. So one of the things I notice when people are looking at a pattern, it'll say to press up. Let's say it, so. Let's say you've got a hem on a pair of pants, or you've got a hem on your cuff, right, or on your sle short sleeve. So it'll say to go ahead and like stitch this seam first, right? You'll put these two together, and you'll stitch that long underarm seam, right? And then it'll tell you to mm -hmm. do the hem. Well, my suggestion is before you sew the inseam on pants, or before you sew that sleeve seam, is to go ahead and press up that amount on your fabric while the fabric or while the piece is flat. Right. On this one, I'm going to fold up a little bit and then fold it up again and stitch it. But let's say it's fold up a, a quarter of an inch and then an inch or whatever. Go ahead and press that because when you come back to do that sleeve seam, mm -hmm. so here's just a mock-up I did. I've got this blue piece that's got the quarter inch seam and then a one inch seam. And then I'm going to do this. And then when I go to stitch it. Right. It's already like that. Not, it's already done. Not, yeah. That is that is an issue because you're trying to put that quarter inch an inch in whenever it's already a, a, a circle, a tube. Yes. Versus when it's flat. Yeah. yeah and it makes a lot of sense. You can burn your hand getting in the, some of these tiny little. Yeah, oh, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one, one suggestion I have. Another is, let's say I'm going to put elastic in this. This is going to be my cuff on my joggers or my sleeve. So instead of taking the elastic and putting a safety pin on the end and you're yes, you're going to sew all the way around this, but you're going to leave this little spot open and you're going to take a safety right. pin on the edge and you're going to run that through. I don't know mm -hmm. why that to me took so long to do that, but God just gave me this idea. I just, it's funny how after a while, something just comes to your mind. And so yeah. I sew the elastic in a loop Okay. And then I sometimes, if it's a real big piece, like for the waist, I will put pins in all four spots. Well, three spots. This this doesn't need a pin where the overlapped is. But you can see how I've overlapped mm -hmm. the edges and stitched them tightly together. So then all I do is I put this within that spot under the fold there. Yeah. And then I just stitch all the way around. You just stretch it out while you're... Yeah, you just stretch it out. Or and The reason I said those oh. three pins is I might divide this blue fabric into three, uh, four sections as well and match up those pins. And then as I sew, I'm matching the pins and I'm okay. stretching the elastic yes. to match those yeah. pins. Does that make sense mm -hmm. as I go? Right. So yeah, so that kind of expedites that process as well. Yeah, and I'm sure you're also trying not to catch the elastic while you're doing that. I guess if it's if it's evenly spaced it's even okay if you catch the elastic maybe. Yeah, I think you if your if your casing is big enough, wide enough, wider than your elastic, you shouldn't have any trouble catching it in there. Some right. some yeah. um, patterns tell you to catch it in there. They want you yes. to catch it and then turn it over. So uh -huh. it kind of depends on what you've what you've got. Yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm sure like with these tips you're sharing, 
nowadays when you use a pattern, you're just using it for the sizing. So you have to think through, okay, what size is a 2T girl? But then once you cut out the pieces, you probably just put it together in your own way. Like you don't read the instructions after after that, the part of getting the sizes, I'm assuming. Yes, but it depends on the pattern. Sometimes there'll be some unusual style detail that maybe I haven't done before. Yeah. I, I will True, read through those yes. instructions. But yes, you'll you'll get so familiar with patterns that you don't really need them. In fact, it's funny. I just bought this pattern recently and there were no instructions inside. <laughs> They're like, you so, already know. If you're buying a pla- a pattern these days, you already know how to do this. Yeah, but I feel bad for the people who, you know, I hope they included them in all the other ones. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you just get your own little ways of doing things. Like you have your ways that the patterns don't even tell you that you know will make it easier. Yes. So. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully that, hopefully those help a little bit. Yeah. So. Yeah, they definitely do. The only other thing to note would be if the pattern, um, has a different seam allowance. Obviously, if you do your own little way, then yours is going to end up too big or too little, you know, but those yes. would be things to And know. I would say if you're doing upholstery or a big job like that, I would give yourself at least an inch of seam allowance and then because you can always cut it down. But because right. you're spending so much money on upholstery fabric, you don't want to mess up and you don't want it yes. to be too small. Right. So. Yeah. I definitely cut differently whenever it's a expensive fabric versus like a thrift shop fabric. I'm like, okay, did I, did I get this exactly what I, how I want it? Yes. And I like to mark if I'm using really expensive fabric, I like to use what's called a tailor tack. Are you familiar with the, what those are? Uh-uh, no. So I, I have a post on that as well, but it's basically stitching and then stitching another, a loop in that between the two pieces of fabric and then you'll pull the so you're what I'm I should back up and say you're cutting out let's say two bodice pieces from your fabric okay and you're needing to mark a a dart point in the middle of this beautiful satin fabric let's say and you don't want to put a pin in there because right. for whatever reason you know maybe your pin would make a yeah that kind yeah. of messes it up so you're going to take a stitch and then you're going to take another stitch and you're going to cut it so it looks like a loop de loop kind of. And then you're going to pull those fabrics apart just a little okay. bit and you're going to snip in between them. That way you've got a thread mark on this one and a mm-hmm. thread mark on this one. That's your dart point. And okay. then you just stitch to that point and pull out the thread. So that's a really good tip for bridal or prom dresses or anything where you don't want a bunch of pin holes in your fabric. Right. Yeah. Well, that's really, that's a really good tip. Okay. So you mentioned that you have that tutorial all over on your website. What are some other tutorials you'd like to point people to that are good ways to either get started or some of your favorite projects over on your site? Wow. It kind of depends on what you're sewing, but I would say that putting in zippers is a, is a real common post that I have, uh, putting in hemming jeans with the original Mm -hmm. hem, because I know when people buy those real expensive jeans, they've got that special hem on the bottom that may be a little bit frayed and you don't want to just cut that off and lose it. Oh, I didn't know about this. Yeah. So there's a post on that. That's been like a common problem. My sisters and I, we all wear petite jeans because I'm average height, but my legs are short. And so I always have that problem. And we actually bought some of the gold thread. So, well, maybe, maybe that's our issue is like, you can tell they're hemmed and that's what we don't like. So that's a, I'm going to have to check that out. (laughs) Yeah. So check that out. I do think the gold thread is really important though. And sometimes I actually buy copper colored thread, if you can imagine. So just look at your jeans and see, you know, they're they're, obviously they're using all different colors. Sometimes they use white to, you know, to stitch jeans, but, but anyway, yeah, just try to match, take your jeans with you to the fabric store and try to match those. So I've got everything from bridal to upholstery to beginning sewing projects. It kind of runs the gamut. It kind of so just poke around and see what your favorite or what you're looking yeah, for, yeah. and hopefully you'll find it. And I'll just keep writing more posts. But yeah, yeah, it's been fun. It, I've really enjoyed it. And I would say too that if somebody has a question, just email me at thesewinggarden at gmail dot com, and I'm happy to write back and send me some photos so I can see what you're looking at. So okay. I can answer your question in a more complete way. Oh, awesome. And then you also have a couple of eBooks, correct? Yes. One is on how to price your work. So if you've got a sewing business and the other is how to start a sewing business. Okay. 
So I like to speak to those people because, again, I was trying to reach people in second and third world countries as well. And I didn't know if they Mm -hmm. had these resources available when I first started my blog. But I think they pertain to whatever kind of business that you've got going. And the pricing book is by far the most popular. And I think it's going to be really beneficial. It'll pay for itself the first time you use it. If you're running a sewing. Yeah, I definitely made that mistake when I first started my shop. I I just couldn't imagine that somebody would spend like more than 20 bucks on a dress. And so it, I had a hard time wrapping my head around like this is actually valuable to somebody. And, and then I also wasn't valuing my time, which I'm sure you go all into that because soon I got to where when somebody would order something, I was actually like, ugh. And I'm like, okay, wait, whoa, whoa. If I'm mad somebody's ordering this, the price is wrong. Yes. And my husband used to say, is this a hobby or a business? And it's either right. answer is fine, but you have to figure it out. If you're trying to make a profit, you want to charge for what you're worth. And mm-hmm. so I also go into um, talking about how do you charge your friends and family? Because that's a difficult one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't know what to do. They want to charge, but they're not sure they should. So I kind of talk about that as well. And then I see that you do like b- business license stuff, tax startup. That's always people love the idea of making a little income from home, but then that part gets intimidating. Yes. Yeah. And that varies from state to state, but it's not hard to find the answers on those questions. Right. Yeah. I think even just having a primer on knowing like, where do I even look? What's, what is it that you need is going to be really helpful. So that's on the sewinggarden.com. And then I see it's just, you just scroll down a little bit and then there it is books. So that's going to be really helpful for people. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate all of your tips. I'm sure you have so many more to offer. We just scratched the surface. So going over to the sewinggarden.com and we'll also leave links down in the show notes in the description box for any specific links that you mentioned so that people can start checking all that out. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. It's been such a pleasure. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Thank you.